Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome back to another ATP video. This video deals with one of the most intimidating topics in microbiology, or at least some people think so. There are a lot of things to know for each of the hepatitis, but the good thing is that it's very conceptual and you don't need to memorize much. It's all about understanding the concepts. So as the name implies, hepatitis is when we have inflammation of the liver which can happen due to many infectious and non-infectious etiologies. Viral hepatitis, secondary to hep viruses, include five main types that you need to be familiar with. Hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. It's important that you know the route by which these infections are acquired, their clinical presentation, and the relevant serology. The treatment, however, is a broad topic and thus will not be covered in this video. This table highlights the main things you should know for each virus. It looks pretty scary now, but we will cover everything and come back to it at the end of the video, so don't worry about it. Starting with Hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is an RNA virus. It is transmitted fecal-orally, classically through shellfish. It causes an acute hepatitis, A for acute, so A for Hep A. Most patients are asymptomatic, and since it's acute, there is no risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. In terms of serology, it's very basic. If the patient has IgM, this is an acute infection. If they have IgG antibodies, then they had an old infection and are now immune. The prognosis is very good, and most patients recover. In acute liver inflammation slash infection, the signs and symptoms to look for include right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, decreased oral intake, accompanied by nausea and vomiting, and sometimes dehydration, in addition to increase in AST and ALT, which are liver enzymes, and other markers of inflammation. These are not specific for hepatitis A virus, but the serology is. Regarding treatment, it's mainly supportive therapy. Moving on to hepatitis B, hepatitis B is a DNA virus, it is transmitted in three main ways, blood, sexual intercourse, and perinatally. It has a long incubation period of many months and can cause both acute and chronic hepatitis. So B for both, B for hepatitis B. Initially, the patient will have non-specific symptoms like rash, arthralgia, and fever. And since this can cause chronic hepatitis, it can lead to cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma which is HCC for short. Serology is a bit complicated, but can be summarized in few golden rules. If the hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, you have infection, which can either be acute or chronic. The hepatitis infectivity antigen, which is HBE antigen, looks for infectivity, and if it's high, you're highly infectious and have a high risk of passing the disease onto others. If you have hepatitis B core antibody, IgM, then you are acutely infected. Whereas if you have IgG antibody against hepatitis B surface antigen, then you are immune, either through past infection or by vaccine. So how would you know exactly? The key test here is the IgG antibody against the hepatitis B core antigen. If it's positive, then immunity was acquired through infection. If it's negative, then immunity was acquired by a vaccination. So, when a person is infected with hepatitis B, how exactly does the infection progress? Initially, during the incubation period, there are no symptoms and no serum markers. The first marker to rise is hepatitis B surface antigen. In the acute phase, there will be a rise in IgM against hepatitis B surface antigen and against the core antigen. These antibodies do such a great job that eventually hepatitis B surface antigen will go down and the person is no longer infected. Shortly after this, IgM also goes down. The core antibody is a bit different. It will plateau and stay positive forever and it's a good marker of past infection. Again, remember, if someone got immunity through vaccination, this antibody would be negative and it wouldn't be present in the blood. The next phase of the infection is where IgG against the surface antigen starts to rise. Again, this is a marker that the person is now immune. One more point. You will notice that there is a point in time when hepatitis B surface antigen has dropped to zero. 
but IgG has not developed yet. This is called the window period. Mainly IgM, hepatitis B core antibody, will be positive. So there's a lot to know for hepatitis B. Make sure you know the serology and the rest should be straightforward. This is the most challenging of all the hepatitis viruses. So it gets much easier from here. Next on the list is hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is an RNA virus. Transmission is mainly through blood. It's very important to remember that sexual transmission, while possible, is mainly for hepatitis B. It causes chronic hepatitis C, so C for chronic, so it doesn't cause acute. And going with our theme so far, since it causes chronic hepatitis, we know it can cause cancer. In terms of serology, we look at the antibody against hepatitis C and hepatitis C RNA. There are a few possibilities. The first one being both negative, which means the person is not infected. The second one is both positive, which means the patient is currently infected with hepatitis C. The third one is antibody negative and HCV RNA positive, which means the patient is acutely infected. Since hepatitis C virus causes chronic hepatitis, this is very rare. Antibody positive, HCV RNA negative, the patient was treated. Next on the list is hepatitis D, which is also an RNA delta virus. The most important thing to remember about hepatitis D is that it's a defective virus. This means that it depends on hepatitis B to enter the liver cells, so hepatitis D infection needs the patient to also have a hepatitis B infection. There are two ways this can happen. Either through super infection, where the patient gets hepatitis B infection and then develops hepatitis D on top of it. This has the worst prognosis. The other way is co-infection, where both infections occur at the same time. This has better prognosis compared to the super infection. Transmission for hepatitis D is the exact same as hepatitis B, which is easy to remember since they occur together. So it's either through blood, sexual intercourse, or perinatally. So the key thing to remember about hepatitis D is it being dependent on hepatitis B. So D for dependent, D for hepatitis D. The last one on the list today is hepatitis E, which is an RNA herpes virus. It's very similar to hepatitis A, in the sense that it has fecal oral transmission and can cause a fulminant hepatitis. The keywords for exam questions are pregnant woman, third world country, presenting with acute hepatitis. Regarding prevention, it depends on the type of hepatitis and how it's transmitted. Hepatitis A and hepatitis B have vaccines. Some general prevention measures include for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, safe needle use should be taught and encouraged in health facilities and needles should not be shared by IV drug users. Similarly, safe sexual contact should be exercised to reduce the transmission risk. For hepatitis A and hepatitis E, hand hygiene and water sanitation is important. All right, to summarize, that was definitely a lot of information in the video, so let us take a quick look at the table we showed you at the start. As you can see, we covered all the main points for each of the viruses. You may want to watch the video a couple of times, especially the part about hepatitis B serology, to make sure it's clear. Make sure you know whether each virus is RNA or DNA, whether it causes an acute or chronic presentation, and learn the relevant serology. And that's it for viral hepatitis. We hope you found it beneficial. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to receive our latest updates. And as always, thanks for watching.